record button. Okay, so the recording has started. Okay, so welcome to our next session of the PhD uh, training in data science. And today we have a special guest, Gabriela Zana. Uh, she is a reader in statistics in the uh, Liverpool John Moose University. Uh, with quite quite a brilliant career uh, and previous experience from Harvard Medical School, University of Oxford, University of Warwick, University of Liverpool, and now uh, LJMU. So welcome, Gabriela, and um, off to you. Thank you very much, Ada. And I would also add, I'm also uh, a visiting researcher at uh, Slovak University of Technology, where I became a doctor habilitation. Uh, one year ago, yeah. So I also have two PhD students attended today. Okay, so I will talk today about a missing data, and I will also call it incomplete data. And for the motivation, I will show what I mean. So what I mean is really this kind of scenario that um, illustrates what sometimes happens when clinical researchers come to me. They will present me with data set. And the data set may be messy. Sometimes it's less messy than this. Um, this one is actually a picture that I took from the book chapter that I did with Katie Bounce in 2019, where we show how the data look like when they need lots of cleaning. But here, I will only highlight these particular scenarios that I circled in pink. And those are entries that are either unknown or there is a question mark or it says not staged, like that could even write down what is the stage. Or maybe you know what is the stage, but the person who collected the data didn't write down what the stage was agreed. Uh, do you see the cursor as I'm pointing? Uh, yes, yeah. Okay, Thank you. good. Um, or sometimes people would just say NA or none, or actually they wouldn't write anything. So all of these I would consider as missing data. And that's a problem because we need to know why they are missing. And if they are missing, what is the consequence for my analysis? Whether my analysis is about uh, correlation, association, finding out risk factors or whether my analysis is about predicting one particular patient, whether the patient has a disease or not. Okay. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is about, okay, what do you mean by missing data? I already mentioned that a little bit. What are potential reasons for missing data? What are the types of missingness? Why does missingness actually matter? And what do we do when data are missing or what we shouldn't do? So, um, so what we mean by missing data is we really mean that some of the values in the matrix are missing. And I would then call this whole matrix as an incomplete data set. Then the reason for missing this can be many, so bear with me. Uh, it can be social or personal reasons related to the patient. So for example, patient or person may not want her value to be recorded on, for example, gender or her weight or smoker, or the person may decide not to do a particular test in the clinic after the person already agrees to participate. She may decide, no, I, I don't want to participate anymore after the person was actually deemed to satisfy inclusion criteria. And we cannot force such a person because in Britain there is such a thing called as Good clinical practice, G, uh, good clinical practice, yeah. Where when I was a member of the clinical trial unit, I had to take this particular test and training every two or three years, um, which actually checked whether, as a statistician, whether I understand all the principles of good clinical practice. And one of them would be we cannot force patients to do a test or to report any values about him if the person doesn't want to. Um, another reason can be the person already participated in the study, like for example, longitudinal study, and every three months the person was arriving, data were collected, 
but then all of a sudden the person decides to not to come anymore, which is what in statistics, in clinical trials, very often is called loss to follow up, uh, also dropout. And this can be for many reasons. One of them can be personal reasons like relocation, or simply person just doesn't want to do it anymore. There can be physical reasons, like person may not be actually able to sustain a particular medical test. We had such a cases where patients had to do multifocal electroretinography, MFERG, which is they had to sit down in a very stiff position looking into a camera, and that camera is sending some signals into the retina, and then this is now collected, some stimulus and the response is collected. And the patient may fell sick after a while because it took about 10, 15 minutes. Um, I haven't done it myself, but actually I was there when several patients have, have it done. All of them have it done, but some of them will actually fall sick and so the measurement haven't been done. So in that case, it's important to write down the reasons why this is not done. Um, another thing can be that we have a patient coming for a longitudinal study several months and all of a sudden person decides not to come anymore. One reason can be actually related to what we are studying. For example, we may want to know uh, whether, we may, we may want to compare two treatments. We want to know what is the effectivity of, for example, treatment A, and patient may be on treatment A. And maybe after several months, that patient patient's vision is getting better. And maybe that treatment is actually expensive, and otherwise the patient wouldn't get it. But because of clinical trial, this is for free. And after patient feels he is better, he may feel like, well, actually, I don't want to participate anymore. I already feel better, and I don't want to come back. I don't have any incentives anymore. So this is actually called informative dropout, because not only the person dropped, it's also informative, because the reason why he dropped gives us some information about his health status. So if we actually completely ignore this patient from analysis, we will underestimate the effect of the treatment because that treatment actually helped him to feel better. Um, there, may be, there may be logical reasons why a person is not uh, is having missing data, such as instrument is out of scale. So for example, in ophthalmology, so that's the area where I mainly work, uh, there is a measurement of stereoacuity, which looks like this. Uh, I don't understand the principles, but what I was told and what I've seen is that it measures stereoacuity, it provides some positive numbers, and as they go bigger and bigger, the stereo stereoacuity gets worse, which is something that quite often happens in ophthalmology, that the actual measurement goes the other way around. But then the instrument gets hits the largest number and it stops. It doesn't provide any more numbers after that. And if the person does not have any stereoacuity because it has only one functioning eye, then it means there is stereoacuity, there is no. We cannot just provide a zero for that patient because zero actually doesn't belong to that scale of that instrument, and zero is actually lower than any number that the instrument provides. So we had to come up with other ways of doing it, and I can invite you for this paper that we did with Jignasa from orthotics, where in this case, we couldn't just drop those patients who did not have stereoacuity because we wanted to know what, how stereoacuity uh, affects the risk of fall. So of course, if we actually omitted all those patients, we would have underestimated effect of stereoacuity on the risk of fall. So we created categories. We said, okay, we have a category of those who don't have stereoacuity, category of those who, who have been paired, and a category of those who had it normal. So we created an ordinal variable, um, and that's how we proceeded. So another logical reasons can be like, not, not, for example, number of pregnancies, of course, we cannot ask a man for such a number. So, and if, if we then write it down in the database, the number of pregnancies for a man, uh, if you write a zero, that zero has a different meaning than a zero for a woman. So we need to be careful about that. Uh, data collection process reasons can also be there, like a protocol violation reasons, where a person who is collecting the data somehow forgot or made a mistake. That happens. It's called a protocol violation. 
Um, but that's just one example of technical violations. And I have been an uh, independent statistician on several national clinical studies in Britain. And the way how they work these national clinical studies is that they must have a steering committee and also data management committee. So I was part of data management committee where we have to meet the leaders of the clinical trial, including the manager, um, manager, the main manager of the trial, and they had to give us a list of all the protocol violations, including these ones where data are missing for reason due to the um, data quality. But then, of course, we also reviewed other things. Um, but that's on, that's one of the ways how, for example, in Britain, um, the authorities, the authorities make sure that the research and the data collection is done in the most objective way. So what, there are several principles that we need to do. We must not pretend as if nothing is missing. Of course, there is something missing. Uh, first, we need to try to reduce the amount of missing data as possible, as much as possible. That's the reason, of course, why, for example, in Britain, there are these data monitoring committees on every clinical trial. Because at every meeting, one of the first questions that independent statisticians ask, okay, show us the missing data. Uh, how many uh, How many are missing? Why they are missing? And explain us everything. Um, then ethics dictate that missing data cannot be avoided. So what I, what I actually mean by that is that every patient must be analyzed in some way. Whether the patient makes it into the main analysis or that patient doesn't make it into an analysis, but it will be part of sub-analysis, everything must be analyzed. Um, information loss cannot be conjured up, meaning there is no magic method to fix the missing data, but there are some methods, but they there is no magic. It cannot solve everything. So the most important thing is try to make sure uh, the least amount of is missing. Um, in clinical studies, in observational studies, they can be that sometimes I would see 25 to 50 percent dropout of patients, those who lead a study. So it's actually a huge thing. Um, in observational studies, they may be variables or features that may have somewhere between 5 to 50 percent missing values. Um, and that's actually true. Uh, I've seen those, those cases. Uh, but typically, uh, in the studies where I was, we would apply a threshold threshold of 20%, and we would say if a feature or a variable or a column has more than 20% missing, it's probably not usable anymore because there may be all sorts of problems there. And those problems would cause bias in our analysis, and we want to avoid bias. Um, so we must try to prevent missing data. So I said that. We must report the reasons for missingness for each individual missing value. So what I mean by that is that not only to say, yeah, is this value of uh, visual acuity is missing, we also need to say why. Is it because the patient refused? Or is it because the data collector forgot to measure it? Um, or is it because there was some problem in the clinic that all of a sudden all the all the instruments to take the measurement were broken. Okay, so that needs to be written and then coded in some way. So typically, if the vision uh, in the number of letters, that's a positive number, then I would use negative numbers to code all the reasons for missing this. Um, typically, if I am actually the one who designed the study and I now oversee how the data are collected, then I have I'm in the best position because now I can go and ask the people how they are collecting it and sometimes even going back and making trying to get those data. Uh, but sometimes I'm not in that position, and that would be in position when somebody already hands me data collected in the past. And then I cannot, of course, go and try to fill in the missing blanks by asking people. But the other but the one thing that I can do, which I was a part of it when I worked in Oxford is that we analyzed the effect of these phosphonate prescriptions on cancer of esophagus. And I noticed, uh, so we had about 3,000 patients, about 30 million 
uh, medication records about 30 million all sorts of diagnoses and requests from clinicians. And I noticed that when it comes to disposable prescription, there was one patient who got 2,000 prescriptions on the, day, on the same day. So, of course, that was not a missing value, but that was some sort of outlier that I could identify by common sense, by thinking, okay, there is no way somebody got prescri prescribed 2,000 values. But I can also get confirmed with clinician who would say, well, such a value can actually get into the system if the clinician forgets his elbow on the keyboard and all of a sudden the same prescription is done 2,000 times. So such things also can happen. Um, the next thing that I will talk about is patterns of missingness. So is the probability that something is missing? Is the probability something uh, is the probability of missingness related to the data that are missing? I mean, to the value that, that is missing and would have been recorded? Is the probability of a value missing relate, unrelated to what would be measured, but related to other variables? Or is the probability completely unrelated to anything? And that means in other words, that means, is there any pattern in the missingness? So that's what I will talk about next. And why we want to know that is because that will then give us a hint whether, uh, how to analyze the data next so that we minimize the bias. And in other words, we want to uncover the mechanism or at least get a feel what the mechanism can be for the missingness. So this is the main slide. Um, so this main slide is, is, is telling the following. If I have my patient arm and he has these values, they may be, so this vector yi can be actually a vector of five values. It can be age, gender, salary, blood pressure, smoking status. Okay. I can also attach to it um, another random variable called ri, and I will call it missing data indicator. So this missing data indicator will only have value 0 and 1. It will have a value of 1 if um, the value of yij is missing. So it can be patient i, smoking status is missing. And 0 if it is observed. So in this case, I will create a dummy variable. In statistics, we call variables dummy if it is something that wasn't directly measured, but I created it as a statistician or we can call it indicator variable and it's going to have value 0 and 1. And we can also define a so-called YIO where YIO is indicate is it is a vector that is the observed part of Y. So the patient may have five values in his Y from the gender, age, salary, etc. So there may be five values, some of them are observed, and that part I will call the observed value, and the rest I will call the missing part. So the observed part would be all the features that are observed and recorded for the patient, and the rest I will call them the missing part for the patient. So now I can define what I mean by these three mechanisms. One of them is called the missing completely at random, and I will also call it there is an acronym that goes around the data science community called NCAR, missing at random and not missing at random. So missing completely at random means that the probability that a value is missing for a patient given, given all the features, all the variables that are recorded on the patient, that probability is equal simply to some number and that number is the same for all the features. In other words, that probability does not depend on the features. It does not depend on the age, does not depend on the gender, salary, blood pressure, everything that I measure on the patient. It doesn't depend on them. Um, it may be related to some other variable outside of the data set that is uncorrelated or 
independent from the variables in my data set from the variables y. So missing at random is the next part. Missing and random means that probability that a value is missing given all the values on that patient, that probability is equal to probability of missing given the observed part. In other words, the probability of missingness only depends on the observed part of the patient. So for example, um, this first patient here, he, for him, we observe the value y2 and y4, and the values y1, y3 are missing, and probability that y3 is missing, that probability is only related to the values of y4 and y2. So y3 can be, for example, smoking status, and the person, we don't have the value on the smoking status, and it may be that the probability that this value is not reported is only related to the gender of the participant and to the salary. So it may be that actually men, they don't want to report the status more likely than women. Okay. So in that case, we call it missing at random. Um, and not missing at random is that when the probability of missingness, given all the features that I'm considering or all the columns that I have here, all the variables, that probability actually depends on the missing values, on the values that would have been otherwise recorded. So, for example, in this case, this patient Y3 is missing, and this would be missing not at random if the probability of missing lens is actually related to the value itself. So, for example, smokers, if Y3 is smoking, and if this missing value is not missing at random, that can happen in scenarios if smokers are less likely to tell that they are smokers. Okay, and that's what we call not missing at random. So it's quite lots of words. <laughs> um, and all this theory is actually due to Donald Rubin. Um, he used to be the head of the Department of Stats at MIT. And so he wrote this first paper about inference and missing data and brought it from first. Like biases. So here is an example about pain management. So there are here 20 chronic pain patients in a pain management program. So we have pain severity, so that can be our Y1 and depression Y2. And this is a complete data set, so nothing is missing. So missing completely at random uh, would be a fact when the data are missing that is independent of both the observed and unobserved values. And the observed scores are a simple random sample of a hypothetical complete data set. Um, so here is one example. We may have a laboratory, and in the laboratory they do a they do lab samples and maybe values on one batch is missing or it wasn't proper proce processed properly. But it may be that the reason why this batch wasn't processed properly, maybe the reason is by something completely unrelated to the laboratory study itself. So in that case, this will be missing completely at random. The data will be missing completely at random. The good thing about this is that if data are missing completely random, that doesn't cause bias in our analysis. It only causes loss of data or loss of power, but not the bias. However, generally, this kind of scenario, missing completely random, is quite strong and often unrealistic, meaning often it doesn't occur. Um, very often data would be missing due to some mechanisms related to the study itself. Uh, but that it does happen sometimes. Um, so in this case, missing completely at random. Uh, so here we have, for example, let's patient one, three. So that we have here five patients 
And let's say for them, the repression is not observed. So we have question marks there. So missing completely Randall would mean that uh, this is unrelated to pain severity, the reason why it's missing, and also it's unrelated to depression. Meaning nothing can predict why it's missing, nothing can explain why these values are missing in, in mathematical sense or statistical sense. Uh, the missing at random. So the missing and random, that missingness can be predicted by the observed scores, meaning um, the values that are observed for the patient, they can explain why things are missing on the other variables. Um, so there is a systematic way why the data are missing, but it's still called missing and random because uh, it is mainly missing and random once. It is missing and random once we control for the observed values of the data. So, for example, uh, male participants may be less likely to tell about their depression severity scores than female participants. So, this would be missing at random because they don't report depression severity scores, but the reason why they report it is not because of depression severity score, but rather than because of their gender. So, in this case, uh, we may want to do Several kinds of analysis can be done. One of them is called a compact case analysis, meaning we will only analyze the patients for whom we have complete data. And that may or may not result in bias. That depends on the actual scenario, on, on an actual concrete case, uh, meaning concrete situation, how we are actually analyzing the data. Uh, so in this case of Depression and pain severity, missing at random. This is a missing at random case. So we have five patients again who have missing depression score, but these depression scores are missing more likely in the patients with low pain severity. So it's only related to the pain severity. Not missing at random, that's when uh, the values are missing because of the values itself, themselves, okay? Um, and this is the worst case, and that's the case that we want, don't want to get into, but that case, of course, happens quite a lot in real life. Um, so for example, in the, in the depression scenario, participants with severe depression, it can happen that they are more likely to refuse to complete a survey about their depression. So in that case, we do have a scenario of not missing the random, and then definitely leads to biases in analysis. So, in so if I illustrated an example like this, um, here participants with low depression scores are more likely to skip depression measure. So, these five they have values of depression 11, 6, 7, and 9, 9. So, that those are one of the small values. So, that would be the not missing the random. So this is a summary. I really like this picture because it illustrates things again, but now via a picture. So this is missing completely at random. This is my depression that has some values missing, and this is the severity. And I may want to study their relationship, for example, or how they are associated. And now I have a mechanism about missingness. And if that mechanism is related to some other variable Z, which is unrelated to severity and depression, then I have a so-called NCAR. MAR would be a scenario where the mechanism of missingness of depression, that mechanism is related to the values of severity. Severity, I mean the pain severity. Um, and then NMAR is a scenario where the mechanism of missingness is related both to the severity of the pain as well as to depression itself. Okay, so the values on depression are missing because of the values themselves, as well as because of the values of the severity of the pain. So that would be the NMA. So why do we uh, why do we care? It's because that can cause a bias. So what I have in the next slides is a very toy example, continuing in the toy example and showing how the bias starts increasing. 
Um, it is only 20 patients, so of course, there is also some random chance going on here, not just bias. But uh, let's see. If I have no missingness, so missing completely at random enter, then I may want to know something more about depression. And one way how I can do it, I can calculate the mean, for example, as a measure of central tendency. And I may get a mean of 14 out of the 20 patients. And I can do the same for the severity of the pain. Um, so there are 12 and 14. Okay, so now what happens in the missing completely random case? Well, in that case, uh, what I can do, I can, what I did at the bottom here, I wrote again what I had in previous slide, when no missing data, so we have this baseline to look at. And now I can ask myself again, okay, what is the central tendency of depression in my sample? So what is the mean? So, and there are two ways to do it. I can either do a complete case analysis, meaning I can calculate the mean from only those patients who have complete data, and there are only 15 of them, of course, okay? Because five of them have incomplete data. So if I do that, if I do complete case analysis, I get mean of the pain severity 12, 12.07. So there was a slight increase, but that can be random chance also, because this is only 20 patients. Um, and when it comes to depression score, that also increased a little bit, but again, this increase can be due to random variations. I can also do complete data analysis, which means I analyze all the data as much as possible. Uh, so for example, in this patient, the first one where the depression is missing, I can still use his pain severity in order to calculate the mean of the pain. And that's exactly what we did here with this number 12. So this number 12 is the mean of all. So that's the same number as we had in previous slide. Um, so that's NCAR example. Uh, the MAR example is then when the depression are missing, but these values are missing at random. They are only related to the values of the pain. So again, what I can do, I can do complete case analysis. So I only have 15 and 15 patients. The severity of pain increases to 13.53, so there is a much bigger increase. And also depression increases to 15. If I do complete data analysis, meaning um, I include in for severity of pain, I include all the patients, but of course I get again the same number of but the depression is 15. So as I said, in my example, we may or may not get biased. That depends on the type of analysis that we do. And at this moment, it is hard to tell whether this is actually biased or not, because of course, these are only 20 patients. But this is for illustration. If I want to study this much better, I would actually uh, simulate 2,000, 20,000 patients, simply a lot, so I can get a large sample uh, study of the effect of this missing Um The NMR example is the example where these values that are missing, they are yeah, they are not missing at random. They are related both to pain severity, but they are also related to actual would be seen value of depression. So when we look at these values, they are even higher than they were before in the previous slide. So uh, that's not random anymore. That movement to the higher numbers here, the 12 and 12.87 and 15.87, that's not random. Uh, there is some bias going on here. So what we saw that uh, when we have uh, MAR or NMAR, it is better when we utilize a complete data um, because the complete case analysis is less preferred to complete data analysis because in complete data analysis we, analyze, we utilize the data better. However, there is no rule or formula to tell how big the bias is. 
it always depends on the study of the case and that statisticians that analysts want to understand the bias, they actually simulate or they do some sort of bootstrapping to get the idea of the bias. Because if there is no um, formula, there is no mathematical expression for it. Um, if you then read a report from somebody, like a data science report, whether they do association study or they do prevalence study or they do even artificial intelligence like classification study, and if they don't actually say anything about missing data, then I'm always suspicious because they may be trying to hide something under the carpet. Um, so there are some ways how to tell what kind of missing data mechanism is ongoing. And the way how to do it is simply looking, well, actually it's not simple, but the way how to do it is by looking at that indicator, the zero one indicator, and to see how it is related to the values that are there in the data set. So for example, here we have uh, the NCAR example. So we had severity and the mean value was 12. And that severity is 12 for the 15 patients for whom the data are not missing. And it's also 12 for the patients for whom some data are missing. So we can actually compare these two values, 12 and 12, whether there is a significant difference. Of course, the p-value here is going to be 1. But um, this is one way how to actually test for whether there is a pattern of missingness by separating the patients into two groups, the patients where the data are missing and they are not missing, and to see whether the means in these two groups are the same by using the two sample tickets. However, when we then conclude that uh, there is no significant difference, this is not a the way how we interpret it, we say we didn't find any evidence for pattern. Okay, so this is not us. We shouldn't say there is no pattern of missingness. We just say there is no evidence that, is, that there is a pattern of missingness. Uh, in our MAR example, when I compare those two means, they are now actually different. So they are 13.5 and 7.4, and the p-value is 0 0.0017. So this is actually significant. So there is um, a significant difference between these two. So this is not NCAR anymore. It can be one of the MAR or MR. But we don't know which one is which. And in fact, there is no statistical test to tell these two apart, MR and MR. And in NMAR example, I can do again the same. I can get two means in the two groups. And Again, one of them is bigger, one of them is smaller, smaller, and the p-value is less than 0 0.05. So again, we ruled out the anchor mechanism, but we don't know which one is which. We only know it's not anchor. Um, then there are ways to visualize missingness. And to visualize missingness, it's, uh, it's not a big science. It's more like an art of figuring out, okay, how do I want to visualize it? How do I want to get some insight? What types of missingness may be going on in my data set? And one way to do it is to, um, well, there is no simple recipe. This is one particular picture that I found on the internet and I thought this is useful, where we have in the columns, we have all these variables. The very first column is actually the ID of the patient. So actually it's not a proper random variable, but it's just the first column. And of course there is nothing missing because everybody got an ID. And then I can just use a color block if it's not missing and color white if it is missing. And I can then interrogate this picture and try to understand what's going on. It looks like right here in the middle, somebody got everything missing or maybe it's two patients after another. So there is no science around it, but uh, it's very, very crucial to do this, um, especially if we actually deal with data sets that have actually quite a large number of errors. And there is another way of visualizing using bar charts where I simply visualize how many values are um, on the y-axis, number of not missing data. So how many 
how many values are there completed, meaning it's not missing. Okay, so of course this one here is actually quite small. So this is another way. Another way we can do actually heat maps. Um, correlation of missingness um, between two columns. Okay, so uh, here we want to understand if one of them is missing, whether also the other one is missing. Now, when it comes to visualization, I know I didn't say much, but uh, that's really up to everybody who's doing analysis what they think is the best for their own data set. But that's something that needs to be done. I know people don't report it as a main part of the reports or papers, but definitely must be something done during the data processing. Now, when we have important the missing data, what do we actually do? So I have a couple of steps. Um, based on my experience, the step one should be always try to identify the patterns. Okay, try to see whether it is missing completely at random or not. Okay, never use zero to code missing values. Okay, uh, I usually use value like NA, like not available, like in R, or I would use some other codes, like I would use number minus nine, negative number, to code missing value if my variable is, for example, H, which is a positive number, so negative number would mean that it's missing. Step two, explore the distribution of missing data and report it fully in the report. This is actually required um, now in medical reports or in any medical journals. Um, and there is actually a, there is actually a consortium of statisticians, data scientists, clinicians. They are called Equator, and they come up with all sorts of guidelines about how people should report their analysis. And part of these guidelines is, it's actually a checklist of everything that we need to do in our report. And by report, I mean a paper that, or a manuscript that we submit for a publication. And they say all these checkpoints that we need to go through. And one of those checkpoints is actually a report how much data is missing and also um, report what methods we in, we use in order to investigate the patterns of missingness and what methods we use in order to analyze the data to mitigate the bias. And some journals they are already requiring, some of them only recommending, but some of them requiring that the people who submit the paper they follow actually those guidelines, at least in medicine. And by journals, I mean journals like Lancet or BMJ. And then the step three would be okay, decide on the best method to analyze. Um, Important tips. Tip number two. Um, if a value is missing, maybe we don't want to drop the patient from analysis at all. Maybe if that value was just missing is, for example, uh, smoking. Sometimes people, they don't want to say whether they are smoking because they are smoking. So we may have three values, current smoker, past smoker, never smoker, and we may have people who actually don't want to tell. So rather than dropping these people completely from analysis, we may create another category, category called missing. And we will analyze it like that. Okay, so when we analyze the effect of smoking on, for example, SFTJ cancer, that's what we did in this paper uh, with Dr. Green. Um, that was actually the first time when I came across to this and she said, no, 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 no. Don't drop these patients. We are going to create another category and we are going to include all patients in analysis when we analyze the effect of the, of the smoking. And actually, the effect of the smoking was not the main effect that we wanted to analyze. We were interested in the effect of these phosphonates, but the smoking was a confounding factor. And even though smoking was only a confounding factor and we were not interested in the, its effect as a main effect to report, we still needed to adjust for it as a confounder. And since it has values missing, we do want to use as many patients as possible. And we also wanted to mitigate bias. And one way to mitigate bias was to include even the patients with missing smoking by introducing this extra category. Um, sorry, I said so many words about this, but actually that's a very, very cool tip 
that people forget. And actually, I wasn't taught this when I did my master's degree in stats or PhD. I only taught, was taught this after I started doing analysis of this cancer epidemiology and reduction. And another important thing that you also find in our paper, try to do sensitivity analysis. Do several ways of analyzing the data and see, sometimes do it as a complete phase analysis, sometimes as a, as a, as a, using this category, extra category, so using all the patients and see whether your results change. In other case, the results and the estimated effect of the discussions. And since the effect didn't change, we said, fine, we don't have bias caused by the messiness, or at least it's very tiny, uh, clinically irrelevant. Um, and that, that was fine. And we were able to publish, but we did have this amount of sensitivity analysis in it. So that's another way how to tell whether we have bias. Um, and this is my last slide. Uh, so missing data is very common. This, in this talk or presentation, I only presented example of missing data and ways how to analyze it when we are only interested in, for example, the, the means. So that's what I call like um, doing doing like a study when I want to understand my groups. Okay, this is also something that belongs to the category of epidemiologic studies when we test hypotheses about groups. Okay, that's where the missing is important. However, I didn't mention anything really about predictive models like artificial intelligence, classification problems, and actually the problem of missing data extends to them too, meaning. Uh, if data are missing, not at random, uh, what can actually happen is that the estimates of sensitivity and specificity, they will be biased. They can be too optimistic. Um, I tried to put some papers on that here, but I couldn't find them. Um, but I did some simulations aside and I actually found out that actually, yes, uh, those, they were biases. Put too much positive sensitive and specificity, too much optimistic. Um, um, that's all. And here at the bottom, there is this uh, link to the report in my talk that I mentioned before. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Let us thank Gabriela for the nice presentation, please. <clears throat> Okay, I will stop the recording. Um, just a moment.